Hello and welcome to Trash to Track. In this episode of Trash to Track, we're going to be looking at this Italian made Riverossi Union Pacific 4884 Big Boy locomotive, a model of the largest steam locomotive in the world. Now, this model is in quite deplorable condition, and as you can see from the yellow tint, it's got a heavy staining of nicotine and a liberal coating of dust on all the surfaces. But it looks to be mainly complete. So what I'm going to do is, before we um, proceed with the restoration, I'm just going to compare it in size to a Backman 40. Now these are large engines themselves, and you can see just how big this model is, even in HO gauge. Having a look at the model, um, there's some pieces missing, notably the smoke box door is missing. There's some handrail pieces. The front is absolutely caked in dirt and fluff and this is going to need a thorough clean and strip down to get it looking at its best again one of the funnels is also um, broken it appears to have been melted but to try and replace that would mean risking damaging the smoke box one piece that is here is this cap for the screw now this is easily lost and you often see these missing so i'm lucky that this is present on this model Looking underneath, it looks to be in generally good condition, albeit every surface, like I said, is filthy. And there's a big old can motor in the cab there that drives the drivetrain. The tender is uh, the tender back is broken, the coupling's missing, and the interior weights are loose. I mean, just look at the amount of wheels there are on this model. 36, I think, all told. And you can see on the top there, on the coal space, there is a lot of dust. This is going to need... Certainly some work to get it back into running order. Although, as you will see as we go along, this model very nearly broke me. It's one of the ones I was closest to giving up on. Also came with this model, this tub of parts, including the missing safety valve there, that can be glued back on, and various screws and handrails that need refitting. Now, as for the smoke box door, it came apparent that the Revel kit, which is also HO, has parts in it so i contacted revel who sent me some spares and what do you know lo and behold the smoke box door from the plastic kit once removed from its sprue is an exact fit for this model something to bear in mind if you've got one of these as parts for these models are extremely hard to come by and anything that does end up on ebay usually goes for high prices but as you can see there that smoke box door is an exact friction fit which is a result really so I'm going to try this model on the track and give it the old track test, but because it's such a large model, I'm going to resort to using a controller. And uh, it takes a bit to get all these wheels on the, uh, on the track on the loco here. There are a lot of, I think like I said 36, I think there is on this model all told. But putting some power on it, the model is dead. It's not picking up any power from the track. It's not even attempting to run. So we're going to have to strip this down and see what's going on on the inside. Before I do strip it down, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to lay the model on its side and put the power leads directly to the brush terminals on the motor. And when the power is applied there, the drivetrain all works and all the driving wheels start turning. So at least we know the motor actually works and that the drivetrain is complete, which is a weight like uh, lifted off my mind. As like I said, spare parts for these are in very short supply. Now to take the body off a River Rossi big boy, you have to remove the screw under the cab, which is missing on my model. You remove the screw under the dome cap there. And the small bolt at the front that holds the bell assembly in place, that is also holding the body shell on. So you need a three millimeter nut spanner to remove that. However, I haven't got one, so I resorted to turning the nut with my tweezer nose pliers um, nut and bolt assembly just turned it just so uh, it came loose and we could remove the body shell this took some time um, to do as i could only turn it a quarter of a turn at a time but once it's loose the entire body shell lifts off and we'll keep that separate now until later as like i said they uh, it needs a jolly good clean up as it is covered in nicotine and dust so looking at the chassis of the model, everything seems to be in place there, and I found this loose wire. Now that may be one of the reasons why this big boy refuses to pick up power through the driving wheels. 
but we're going to start by stripping it down um, and giving it a thorough service. Now you need to remove these gearboxes or transmission boxes to give these a clean and fresh lubrication and you do that by removing these screws. That one there also holds a brass pickup part in place and you remove the two screws out of the die cast weight. The transmission box lifts up gently, the top comes off like that and you can see in there the gears and the front one was also removed and then this was pulled apart along with the drive shafts. There, there is a connecting piece um, between these transmission boxes and the uh, driving worm gear in the, in the front truck and they need to line up correctly when you reassemble the model. By opening these transmission boxes up all the cogs look good. The lubrication in there is very sticky, it hasn't been used in a very long time. So I'm going to give these a thorough clean up and some fresh lubrication before reassembling the chassis and drivetrain. Just pushing it gently there proves that all the wheels are nice and free, although one of the trucks is very stiff, and we'll come back to this later on. To remove the motor from the model, you have to remove these two small screws. Again, access to this was quite difficult, but I wanted to remove the motor to service it, and I'm also going to try and fit a digital decoder to this model. However, this model um, motor that's included is very difficult to service as it's not an easy uh, thing to take it apart. You have to um, remove the brushes and springs, and this one has one of those brass type brushes in it that keeps the commutator faceplate clean. And um, the other brush was stuck solid in there and a few taps made it fall out. But then you have to work on these uh, model by removing the metal pressed in tabs. You have to try and, um, you have to try and force these back gently to remove the motor um, motor faceplate and this took a lot of work and a lot of patience for one I didn't want to damage the motor and two I didn't want to damage the metal this model actually bit back and I slipped with the screwdriver and actually cut my hand open and the end of my finger like I said before this rebuild nearly didn't happen but we'll come back to that later now we've opened the model up you can see that the commutator faceplate there is actually very very dirty so I clean it up with my usual method of a cotton bud and methylated spirits, followed by cleaning out the gaps in the brass plates and then polishing it with a fiberglass pencil, just so that everything is squeaky clean, as I don't think this model has ever been serviced since it left the factory in Italy in probably the early 1980s. Judging by the type of motor in this model, that is when I believe this one was actually released. While I'm just cleaning the motor here, it's going to be worth giving a shout out to uh, Harrison over at SMT Mainline, who also restores locomotives. He worked on a big boy, and I referenced his video numerous times during the rebuilding of my own big boy, although his was a lot more simpler rebuild than mine was. Every time I thought I'd overcome a problem with this big boy, it seemed to throw up another one. And it got to the point eventually where I was on the verge of giving up, deleting the footage and not bothering with it. But I'm glad I persisted as you'll see later on. So now we've cleaned all the motor up. I'm going to uh, just remove all the stuff off the bench there. And then I'm going to reassemble the motor by putting this faceplate back on and then gently bending the metal clips back over to hold it in place. Once that's all been clipped back into place you can refit the brushes. I also put a tiny amount of oil on both of the bearings there on the drive shaft and then we'll give it a go with the power lead to see if the motor turns uh, better than it did. I also give the brushes a quick clean up as these had a lot of carbon deposits on them as well. That's actually the hollow uh, brass part there and it's got a groove in it where the spring sits. So this actually went on the um, right hand side I think as looking at it. That's it. So we put that back in there and then gently manipulate the spring to hold it back in place. This really is quite a large motor and it needs to be because to turn all those drive wheels through the drivetrain and the gearboxes takes a lot of power. Although this motor is quite old and I'm a bit worried on how it will react when we fit a digital decoder to it. As I'd like to be able to run this big boy occasionally on the garden railway 
and we'll also give it a test run later to see if it'll actually make it around my indoor layout but because it's such a long articulated model i'm worried about the curves on my own layout so here we are, like I said, the brushes are back in and just a tiny amount of oil just on the drive shafts there, just so that it's lubricated and spins nicely. A battery test and the motor spins really nice and it was a very um, quiet, if a little lumpy, running. So now that's all done, I've got myself some warm soapy water and I'm going to give these gear transmission boxes a thorough clean up and there are some tiny little washers in here. Um, that go on the shafts so if you ever strip one of these down be sure not to lose them they're all plonked in the water and then using uh, an old toothbrush I've uh, been banned from using the wife's toothbrush now the dental bills are just getting too much I, uh, I gently use the toothbrush just to clean out all the old grease and lubrication that's uh, accumulated and it's actually gone quite sticky so it was adding um, adding resistance to this already resistance heavy drive i'm sure that if river Rossi designers had thought about it they could have come up with a better drive for this uh, model i think even tender drive with the front wheels free rolling would have probably been more preferable than the setup that they've actually got in here as it is quite a complex drive system and taking it apart really isn't for the faint-hearted there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of gears included in this model. So now that everything's been washed, I'm going to uh, just dry everything off. And as you can see on the kitchen roll there, even though it's been washed in hot water with soap, there's still grease and grud coming off the uh, gear shafts. So everything was given a thorough cleaning and dried off, and then everything was also sprayed with contact cleaner, just to remove any remnants that the hot soapy water didn't get off. And you can see here, look, just with these cotton buds, even though I've washed this with a toothbrush, going over it with a cotton bud, it's still picking up all this horrible, thick, gloopy grease that's been put onto these uh, um, transmission boxes in the past. Once that's all cleaned up, we will look at start reassembling these gearboxes, or transmission boxes, as I keep calling them. To reassemble these uh, transmission boxes, the brass um, brass bearing cups go on the end of the worm gear there, and then you would simply push fit into these plastic housing and make sure the gears all mesh up correctly um, with the worm gear that's uh, permanently fixed in with the drive shaft. And then once everything's on, there's also a small washer that goes on the drive shaft um, between the two plastic parts just to make sure that they're correct distance uh, apart when you screw them back down once um, these were reassembled I actually filled these plastic transmission boxes with oil and grease I filled them up as much as I dare these aren't going to be anywhere near the track and because they're metal on metal parts I really didn't want the uh, lubrication to run out and then the metal parts start wearing out so the more lubrication you can get in here the better and like I said because it is nowhere near the track it's, there's no danger of this spreading onto the rails and contaminating your layout. So here I am applying the usual silicon grease um, with a cocktail stick. I've had a few people ask me where I get that from. Uh, that tub was actually from Eileen's Emporium, which is now unfortunately closed down. So uh, I have actually bought myself some Labelle 103 grease from the local model shop. And I will start using that once, uh, once this supply of silicon grease runs out. So I'm just turning the cogs there just to spread the gear, um, the grease through the gear train. And then the top of the transmission box is clipped on. And that's all ready to be refitted to the model. Now before we refit that to the model, I'm going to get the chassis now and I'm going to get an old paintbrush. And I'm going to give it a thorough dusting over to remove all the dust and fluff particles that have gathered on this um, over the last few years it's been in storage. So just every surface I could, I dusted off, including the front. The front took a lot of work. There was an awful lot of dirt and dust on the front of this model. It's obviously been sat on a shelf for waiting and restoration for some years. And uh, this guy listed it on Facebook, and I bought this specifically to do on this trash to track. I do like the big boy locos. They are huge in real life, and I'd like to go over this. Maybe next time I go to the States, I'll have to go and seek one out to see one in real life. 
So as I said earlier, there's a tube in there with a groove in which fits that drive shaft. So you have to make sure they're lined up correctly. Otherwise, there will be no power transferred from the transmission box to the drive wheels. Once it's in place, I simply reattach the screws that we took off earlier and then reapply the drive shafts between the two transmission boxes and then the one between the um, transmission box and the motor. Don't uh, over tighten screws, I say that in most of my videos, especially on this big boy, as this had obviously been apart numerous times in the past, as several of the screws were on the verge of threading themselves and it took a lot to get them tight. I didn't want to over tighten them and then have to re tap the holes, but the screws, especially what hold the body shell on into the plastic parts, were pretty much um, all, almost past their best. So applying power to the motor now, you can see that the transmission boxes are both working correctly and the drive shafts are turning. So now I'm going to turn my attention to the underside of the model and just check out what's going on in each of these drive trucks. Make sure there's no hairs on the axles, any fluff build up and just throw in a little bit of uh, fresh oil as this hasn't been worked on for several years. The oil that was in it will uh, need replacing. So the first thing I do is remove the screws that hold this um, flexible plastic joiner. Then I remove the rear screw which removes this uh, keeper plate and rear, rear bogey. And then we are into the chassis of the drive, uh, drive truck for the rear of the model. And it looks very, very clean. There's very little dust and fluff in this. I'm just using a cotton bit of mess there just to remove any of the remnants of the old oil. But other than that, it looks very clean and dry. So I'm going to re-grease the worm gear and re-oil the axles and then I'll replace the keeper plate and do the front uh, truck in exactly the same way. This keeper plate goes on a specific way. There's a hole in the bottom of it where the um, worm gear sits through so you have to make sure that it's all correctly aligned otherwise it won't screw down properly. So once that's all done, we're just going to have a quick peek in the front truck there. And you can see again, that's very clean. No fluff and hair and that in there. It just needed the old lubrication cleaning away and uh, a bit of fresh lubrication added. Whilst the front uh, pony truck was off, I took the opportunity just to clean the um, crud encrusted wheels on this using a uh, cotton bud and some methylated spirits. It's essential that all the wheels on the big boy locomotive part are very clean as both the pony truck at the front and rear pick up power for the motor and the drive wheels pick up from one side each. So I've soldered the wire back onto the motor terminal now and I'm just giving it a quick run. And it's not the best runner, it's very shaky. Especially going backwards, it just didn't seem to want to run correctly. So I thought, well, it could be that the fact that I've not actually cleaned the drive wheels yet. So I upend the chassis into my loco cradle at first and then holding the power wires to the motor, clean the wheels with my fiberglass pencil. And then the wheel backs were cleaned with the, fiber, uh, with the fiberglass pencil. And then everything was polished up with cotton bud and methylated spirits. I actually found it easier in the end to work on the big boy facing away from me like this, resting upon the wood. The uh, loco crater was good, but uh, there were so many moving parts. One, one part or another kept getting jammed, so I had to actually clean all the wheels with it outside of the cradle. And uh, this took a, a long while because there are a lot of wheels to clean on this, but you can see now that they are all shining like a new pin. So I'm hoping now that that's going to improve the running quality. I'm also just going to give the side rods a bit of a clean and polish there. As like I said, the yellow tarnish on this is uh, nicotine. It's obviously been stored in a room where somebody's been smoking in the past. And it did take a lot of effort to remove most of it from the uh, loco. Talking of cleaning, I've got the toothbrush out again now after cleaning it. And I'm going to give the body shell a thorough scrub with uh, some fresh, clean, soapy water. And this was done gently as to not damage any parts on the body shell. And uh, I really did want to try and get this back to its best. so. Working methodically from the cab end to the front. And you can see there, I, now I notice that uh, the cab roof's actually damaged on this. 
but we'll have to see about that later on as I hadn't realized that when I'd done the uh, model so trying to clean the front up there which is painted silver it just wouldn't come up as shiny and uh, new as I'd have liked it really was quite heavily stained so uh, I end up repainting the front silver I've got to paint the smoke box door anyway so repainting that part of the model ensured that all the paint matched so I'm also going to just dust off the tender while I've got that warm soapy water here so first off I remove all the loose dust and debris using a old stiff paintbrush and then once that was done the toothbrush came out again and I worked on the body sides and top of the tender to try and remove the nicotine staining and the dust the Union Pacific logo on the tender side there um, had yellowed quite badly but after washing it in this method it did come up rather nice. So we're going back to this front here. I'm trying to polish off the staining with a cotton bud. And you can see the yellow staining there coming off onto the cotton bud. But this was futile in the end. It just wouldn't come up as nice as I wanted it. So like I said, I, um, I repainted it with some silver paint. The back of the tender there, which had unclipped itself, this was also given a good washing as the MUP4013 logos there should be white and they were actually uh, yellow. So while all that's drying we're going to now try and fit a digital decoder to this model and I've gone for my standard go-to Backman decoder initially thinking that it would work okay. Now it's chipped now, I've uh, foregone the soldering done, I've done that before. Uh, basically it's red and black wire to track pickup, orange and grey to motor and it's on my test track now and under DC control it appears to run okay although again it's very very juddery so I'm now starting to scratch my head and think well I've done everything I can with this I'm not sure why the running qualities on this loco are as bad as they are but there's one vital piece of equipment missing that I haven't actually noticed yet but you'll find out what that is very shortly so I've put the body shell just temporary back onto the chassis here and I'm replacing this handrail guard on the front just using a small amount of super glue to hold it in place and luckily enough the one that was missing was actually in that little tub of parts that was sent with this model so just applying it to the handrail that's in place there this was also fixed in place with some super glue and the front end of the big boy is starting to look nice again I am happy that most of the handrails on the front um, if not all the handrails on the front were still in place because bending up brass wire um, would have been very time consuming and then I'd have had to paint it all and try and scratch build some of these guards which wouldn't have been the easiest thing to do. So uh, I'm very pleased that they was all included and hadn't been lost in the annals of time. You can just see there on the front snowplow or cow catcher, sorry, cow catcher on the big boy, a buckeye coupling. And this is actually a neat feature on this model as that folds into the cow catcher and is actually hidden away. As you can see here in this shot, it's actually folded into the cow catcher so it's not always on show. So I'm just giving this a final dusting off now just to remove any little bits of fluff that I've been, have been left over. And it's actually starting to look rather nice. Oh, and now I am demonstrating that um, hidden book eye coupler there. Yeah, it's a very neat feature of this model. So using a pot of Revel acrylic uh, silver, I'm going to paint the smoke box door um, silver to match the um, smoke box on the model, and then give the smoke box and chimneys a new coat of silver paint. So just holding it there, I'm going to brush paint this, as uh, when it's dry, um, you really can't see any brush marks in it, and it does look quite nice. The only thing I wish I'd have done in hindsight was to scrape off that plastic molded handrail on the front there and replaced it with some handrail wire but we might do that when we revisit this big boy in a future episode of trash to track but again we'll cover that shortly i'd also like to get some transfers to put in the wings on top of the smoke box door as um, my model is 4013 and i hadn't actually got any numbers to make that up when i filmed this rebuild so repainting the um front of the model there you can see the big difference between the nicotine stained silver on the model and the fresh paint that I've just put on it 
and it really has smartened the front of this locomotive up quite a lot. So now I'm going to uh, start on looking at mending the tender while that silver paint dries. And first off, I'm going to insert these two weights, and they actually sit in plastic lugs that are moulded into the tender chassis. And then once they're in, I am going to replace the tender rear part um, using my satin varnish method. I'm just going to dust it off there as there's a bit of fluff on there. But applying a liberal amount of Rowmatch satin varnish, this will hold the tender back in place, secure enough so that it doesn't fall out. But if I ever want to open the tender up in the future, um, maybe to fit DCC sound or some stay alive capacitors or something of that ilk, I can easily prise it away without damaging it and I can get access to the interior of the tender should I need to. Once the satin varnish is on, it's just lining it up and it actually clips into place around the weights. Any excess satin varnish was mopped off with a cotton bud and that was left to dry. So while that's drying, I'm going to give the tender wheels a quick clean with some cotton buds and methylated spirits. And you can see there that there's quite a lot of muck coming off the wheel flanges. So these were all cleaned as well. <laughs> Obviously, this model has got more wheels on it than I've ever cleaned in one go. It's just, um, there's just wheels everywhere. In fact, this tender is known as a centipede tender due to the amount of wheels it's got. I actually found an old um, book eye coupling in a spares box that I've got and I fitted that to the rear of the tender. So now the front of the model there is looking rather nice. I've also put the Revel bell on it. So the front end is now complete by the transfers. And it still wouldn't run properly. And then I looked at these two pieces here between the chassis and the driving trucks. And these are sprung. And I initially thought these conducted electricity to the pickups. So I decided to clean them. And to my absolute horror, they were absolutely filthy. With the cotton bud and mess, this removed just, I mean, look at that grease and grime on there. It was just horrendous. So I thought I'd now cracked it. So I took it out into the garage for a test run. And it shot off initially. And then I pull it back as after it had stopped off camera. And as you can see, it just wouldn't run. The power is on full. The motor was buzzing. But it just wouldn't run properly. So it was back to the drawing board with this. And this engine I worked on for about four weeks on and off, and it was frustrating as hell. So you can see here it's inside on DC. It's just stuttering and starting everywhere. It just would not run very well. But then if I put a weight on one side, like this old soldering iron tip, it actually romped away quite nice. And the chassis and drivetrain run quite smoothly albeit that rear driving truck was a little bit stiff and then i turned to harrison's video again to see what was missing on my model and it became apparent that there's a wire from the front truck to the chassis at there that was missing so i fashioned up a brass um, contact for that screw and then there's actually inside there in all that pipe work is a solder tab you can just see it there where i point to it with that screwdriver which should have a wire on it so it's actually missing an entire pickup wire so i fashion that brass um, retainer and then i undo the pipe work and solder the wire back onto that brass tab there you can see and once that's in place i'm going to give it another test hoping to goodness that i've actually remedied the poor running of this model so holding this in place with my tweezer nose pliers, and uh, sorry about the shoddy camera work there, I soldered that on, and now without the extra weight that I put on one side, the chassis is now running relatively nicely on DC. But then again, I put it on the layout, it was romping around on the seawall, and then for no apparent reason just kept stopping. So at this point, I've unsoldered the decoder from the motor and I'm going to have a look at this as the motor runs quite lumpy. So when I took it out and put some battery on it, the motor was actually kind of shaking itself. And I believe that one of the poles, uh, one of the coils in the motor has either failed or is on its way out. 
So a three pole motor is only running on two poles, so it's uneven. So I looked through my box of bits and I've actually got this Hornby motor off an old A4. So I'm going to attempt to re motor this um, chassis with this model, uh, sorry, with this motor. Now, my own A4, Union of South Africa, will pull 14, 15 carriages around the layout, so I know it's a powerful motor. Question is, is it powerful enough for this model? So, to mount this, I actually get my uh, cutting disc and a Dremel multi tool, cut the old motor mounting off the back of the uh, motor there, off the back of the die cast chassis, sorry, build up the um, frame with plastic card. And I'm going to hot glue the motor into place. I've also amended the drive shaft and ground down the motor shaft on the Hornby motor so it's got a flat end so that all it all fits nicely. However, I ended up cutting that drive shaft a bit too small, so I made my own from plastic rod, as you can see here, and the motor's all hot glued into place. And testing it with DC, it seemed to work okay. So I'm going to Resolder the decoder and this time I've changed it to an AE models decoder as it's got a higher amperage on it and the chassis runs the remotoring was a success and it seems to run very well on DC as you can see here but there was still a problem with it it still wasn't running correctly so I stripped it down again and as you can see if I push the front truck without the transmission box the wheels turn freely. The rear truck, however, when it's uh, off, if I push this gently, the wheels are locked solid. So it needs quite a bit of force to get those wheels to go round. So either I have bent one of the side rods, or it was already bent, which is why the motor was straining in the first place. So I end up stripping this down completely. I remove everything off this drive truck, Starting with the chassis keeper plate, I removed the worm gear and then I took all the side rods off both sides of the loco, cleaned everything up, straightened everything out. I re lubricated this, um, this worm gear or drive gear that comes down from that transmission box and I made sure that the cylinders were smooth, there was no plastic flashing on them. And I really should give a shout out to the River Rossi Models Facebook page as the guys on there did give me quite a lot of help um, with my posts about this model. And also uh, to Matt at the model shop who also was very helpful with um, the decoders and the motor on this model. So now everything's been rebuilt. The truck's been rebuilt. The motor is in place. There's additional weight there. And I've also put additional weight in the um, body shell with these self adhesive weights from um, the motor industry that they put on tires and with the additional weight and the re repaired and replaced front pickup it now seems to be running rather nicely but again it does seem to run better on DC than it does DCC so I've virtually got to the end of this rebuild now um, you can see the front end there looks vastly different to when we started it and I am happy-ish with how this model has turned out. Just giving it a quick test run there on DC and it seems to be fine. So I'm not overly happy with it. It is running, but I'm not 100% happy with this. So we will be revisiting this in a future episode of Trash to Track. But for now, let's remind ourselves of what I started with. This cheap facebook big boy was sold to me as a non-runner and when it arrived you can see the front end was quite smashed and it was missing some detail parts the revel ho gauge kit came to the rescue and provided the parts i needed i've given it a thorough rebuild a thorough cleanup the front's been repainted and i've replaced and repaired all the wires and even remoted this model and this is what she looks like now she looks very, very nice, and it is a stunning model. It is absolutely huge. The pictures on screen don't do it justice. But I am happy with how it is for now, and I also rebuilt the tender, which you will see shortly, and this was cleaned and spruced up, and the couplings were replaced. If you've got an engine you'd like to see featured on a future episode of Trash to Track, please email me with the, on the email address that's coming up on the screen very shortly. 
and I cannot end this video without giving a massive shout out to the guys over at Nebraska 66 who have allowed me to use their song, Roll On Big Boy, for the running shots on this Trash to Track episode. So I hope you've enjoyed this rebuild. Again, thanks to SMT Mainline and Harrison and Matt over at the Model Shop and the River Rossi Facebook page for helping me rebuild this model. We will be revisiting it. But until then, please like, share and subscribe and I'll catch you in the next video. Thank you all so much for watching. past is born again at last to rumble over mountains and the plains from the golden age of steam an engine seldom seen by those who never lived in bygone days big boy was her name and went on to railroad fame as the largest engine on the UP Last of all her class, she survives from out the past To show the power of steam in modern time Roll on, big boy, roll on, big boy Rumbling across the northern plains Roll on, big boy, roll on, big boy Climbing up the Wasatch Mountain Range progress for the time no dry eye could be found in jungles or in towns where once big boy had rolled women in her prime from the junkyards of the past 4014 is the last to carry on the legacy of steam at 488 and 4 and a part of railroad lore she roars from out the past like some lost dream Roll on, big boy, roll on, big boy Rumbling across the northern plains